Good morning, happy Sabbath. I'll be reading from 1 Timothy 2, 3 to 6 this morning. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior, who will have all men to be saved and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself a ransom for all, to be testified in due time. Amen. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. Good to see everyone here today. Um, since uh, Tom put me on to speak this week, <laughs> yeah, yes, <laughs> um, I decided this is a great time to update you on what we're doing in the Philippines. And um, there has been a lot of activity, and we've been moving forward with things, and so I would like to actually start out by showing you some pictures of some of the things that we have done. Um, so for those who don't know, um, our church here is uh, very generous in supporting um, our mission project, which is called Philippine Global Mission Project and Philippine Evangelism. And um, this all started back, um, uh, back in 2006 or so when um, uh, Juneville's dad, uh, we just built a church in his hometown. And um, just to get you an idea, this is... Uh, Oh, it's okay, you'll come there. This is the Philippines, just in case you don't know where that is. Um, the Philippines is, consists of uh, over 7,600 islands and um, has a little over uh, 100 million people that live there. Um, the area that we're working is in the central part of the Philippines, and um, if you see the, the yellow dots up there, um, those are the three main areas that w currently we are working. And um, uh, this here is in Libas. So uh, I'm going to just, that's this area right here. That's the opening, that's where we first started, is in this. And this is where we built a church and a preschool. And, um, okay. Don't worry, he'll come back. But we, um, this is where we first built a, uh, a church and pre preschool. And this is where we um, currently send school supplies through um, gifts of, from the heart to that area. Is that back yet? It will come back eventually. This, there's a glitch in this projector, I think. This is the second time it's happened to me, and last time it came back. So I'm hoping it will. If not, we might have to reset the projector. Um, picture's back there, though, if you want to turn around and look. <laughs> um, anyway, so Libas, we, we built this church in 2006, and then it, um, uh, uh, and my father in law kind of supported it for uh, a number of years. And uh, the preschool currently has uh, 31 students in it and has been averaging 30 to 35, maybe up to 40 each year. So it, uh, it's a well-attended preschool, but we only have one teacher. And hit the, um, hit the blank. And then put it back on then. No, okay. Um, just restart it. Hit, just hit standby twice. Okay, let's sit just for a minute here. And then um, turn it back on. Sorry about this. This was not planned. Um, so let me just tell you about, a little bit about Libus. Real quick, um, 
So we've had some... Uh, I've come to find out within the last month that the, the preschool is not recognized by the government and it's not recognized by the conference, which was a surprise to me. Um, and so we want to establish that. We want us to get the, um, it established at least with the conference. And um, so one thing I thought about doing is we need to have some type of, uh, we have a pastor there, uh, but he's a district pastor and he has 15 churches. And so they rarely see a pastor there. And um, so my pl thoughts and plans were, I was talking to Juneville, is, is to hire a pastor to come in there and hire and, and have his wife be the principal of the school. There it is. Okay. And so, um, but the government has changed the way they allow you to establish a school within the last uh, four or five years. And now you have to, in order to have a school, you have to have it on at least one hectare of land, which is about two and a half acres. And we, this is just a small little lot, and it's not even close to becoming a hectare. So we're in the process of possibly looking for another piece of land and possibly building a school. And we've had a big, we've had a lot of requests to start a secondary school, an elementary school there. We get 31 students each year, and we have plenty of students that would probably go to, this, to, the, to the elementary school. So, um, so that is something we're starting to look into right now. Of course, that's going to cost a lot of extra money, and we, we don't know where that is. But if the Lord wants something like this, he will provide, and I have no doubt about that whatsoever. Um, this is our teacher there and with a few of her students. And, um, and this is uh, the students receiving some gifts from uh, our church, uh, school supplies, backpacks, and stuff like that. And, and we've shown this. We've had some construction um, there uh, uh, this past uh, uh, couple months. Uh, the, the government did a road, road widening, which took away um, all this, the play area for the, school, for the children, took it all away. And so we have no play area now, but we had to rebuild this wall here um, and separate, and that's what we did. So, and it's, it's probably a good thing that we are starting to look maybe for some new land to build a new school. So um, that was, that's, that's, that might be my thing here. Anyways, okay, I won't use it. Um, so that's this area up there. Now we're going to kind of come over here to Pontevedra. And Pontevedra is a school that we, we, we built this school. And um, a four-classroom school. Took it from a two-classroom school, made it a four-classroom school. And um, soon after, within two years after we built it, we realized we needed two more classrooms. And we built two more classrooms, but ran into some permit problems with the government. And... Um, and so construction stopped for two years. This, is basic, this picture was taken in 2017, and it still looks the same right now. But we now have all the permits um, in order, um, and we have the green light to finish building, and we hope to get started that by the end of this month, I mean, end of Aug by the end of August for sure, hopefully. And then it should be completed by October. So then that will be all done. Uh, we also do Philippine evangelism, and Philippine evangelism uh, kind of came up after I was over there in 2017, and I realized how little um, uh, Bibles and, and spirit of prophecy and religious materials that they don't have. And so since uh, 2017, um, with the help of our church here, uh, we've, we've supplied over 200 Bibles close to 300 Bibles. We've supplied some spirit of properties and lots of evangelistic materials. Um, here's some pictures of some of the Bible study uh, groups that uh, meet that never had any Bibles. Now they do. And so that's, that's just kind of a recap of what we've been doing. So our new project is the Alicante Church, which is... I don't know if I have a map. Yes, I do. Okay. 
which is actually located in the, on this on the Isle of Negros here at the top there. Um, this um, in the in the mark at the bottom is where Pontevedra is. So this is a small church that um, rose out of um, uh, from an evangelistic crusade. They had about thirty baptisms from evangelistic crusade, and they um, needed a church in that area. There was no Adventist church. And so after a couple years of trying to raise money, they raised enough money, and they got that far. And um, so out of, I don't know how in the world I was able to get in contact with this pastor, but somehow he showed up on my Facebook Messenger, started just texting some stuff, and I said, who are you? And um, he says, oh, well, I'm just a pastor here, and da-da-da, and, and, I, and he says, and we're trying to build a church. And I said, oh, nice, okay. And he started sending me some pictures. And so I said, well, you know, it's kind of interesting because I go, um, we kind of helped do that. And um, he says, oh, really? So, and he says, would you be interested in helping me? And I said, well, send me some pictures and send me what you got. And, and so he sent me all this information. And I said, sure. So in October of 2018, we, start, we started building this church. We funded them to build, uh, finish building the church. And by February, uh, the church was completed. And sorry for the bad picture there. Um, and this is what the church looks like. Um, somewhat completed. It's not completely completed. And here they are meeting there. Uh, this is actually uh, right after um, uh, the church was built. School lets out in, in end of March, and they started their first VBS. And it was very successful, and they had 60 students from the neighborhood come, or 60 students, 60 um, kids come uh, to the VBS. And um, we thought, well, that is really good. And here's them doing some uh, uh, crafts and stuff. We sent a little bit of money for, for them to buy crafts and stuff for, the, for this. And um, just here's a few pictures here. And, and this is, so the church isn't completely done. Uh, the money that we had sent there only put the roof on it and completed the sanctuary. What I didn't know is that they also wanted to add a children's division. And so they asked if we would be interested in helping them do the children's division. And of course I said yes. And so um, just this month, beginning of this month, July, um, I sent them $2,000 uh, to complete the Sabbath school division and hopefully do a couple extra things there um, there at the church. And this is, this, is, this is the latest picture. This here was sent to me um, last week. So they're making good progress on it. And... Um, and hopefully we'll get some completed pictures within a month or two. Uh, this church is very active. I really like this church because it is so active in, in the community. They're already forming a Pathfinders and getting the kids involved. And one of the things they do is they take the kids out and they help the community. And one of the things they do is pick up trash. And so here on this rainy day, it looks like you tell that they're, all their hairs are wet. And um, they are um, out picking up trash in the community, and, um, which I thought was really good. And there's all their bags of trash that they had picked up. So it's a really good to see this active. This church also has three feeding programs. And I said, well, why do we have free feeding programs? He says, because most of the people in this area, most of the kids are malnourished, and they don't get enough food. And so they have three different free feeding programs, one at the church, one in town, and one at the school, one of their public schools there. And uh, so this is just some pictures of them uh, at the feeding program here. Um, and I was really surprised to see this. This is at the public school there. And, um, and I, I said, well, don't they supply lunch for them? And they says, oh, no, not really. They, they need to bring some, and most, people, most kids don't bring any food. And so they have no food. So they go, and they, they, I think twice a week they go to the school, and they supply some rice soup and snacks for them. 
And maybe that's why they're so small, because they just don't eat enough, you know. They're little people. Uh, I don't know if you remember this picture from before. Uh, we had, uh, these are, th- there's five kids that were from, that attended our vacation Bible school there, and that are extra poor, don't have money to, to buy school supplies, don't have money to get uniforms to go to school. Um, and so they asked me if I would uh, donate some clothing and, and shoes and school supplies. Of course, I said, yeah, of course. And so they went and they took them to, the, to their market and they shopped, and here they got, you can see they got new shoes. They're, they're holding their uniforms and, um, and ready to go to school. This was the 1st of June. And here's, a, they even got them backpacks to carry their, their stuff in. Um, and then this is after the next day for school. they were wearing their stuff, and they're all, he, the pastor goes and picks them all up and takes them on his motorcycle. They can all fit in there, all five of them. Two on the seat there, then the, then the driver in front, and then you can get three or four people in the sidecar. So, yes. Um, so, uh, I forget who gave me these young disciples things. I don't know if it was Barb. Yes. I have always been a little hesitant to take these because I don't know if they're going to actually use them. And so, I sent this picture of young disciples to him, and I said would your church be interested in the Young Disciples magazine and the Bible lessons? And he says, wow. He says, that's an answer to prayer. He says, we've been hoping to get something like this, but don't have the money to do it. So Barbara, save all of them, all your extra that you have, because we will send it to the Philippines. I have six um, boxes already that she gave it gave us, and um, we will send that out. Um, I have a box to get ready to send anyways to the Philippines. I was hoping to get it in maybe uh, by the end of the month. We'll see. And um, so anyways, so I just, if you don't, if you forgot, I had been collecting books. I remember donating books to, and it, we've been doing this for a while actually, and I kind of didn't send that anything. I just kind of kept collecting. I ended up collecting 10 boxes of books. And these boxes are about like this, about like this. And I filled them all with books. Three sisters, our three sister school also donated some textbooks. And, um, and then I, once I had 10 boxes completely full, I shipped them all uh, to the Philippines. And uh, this is them receiving them. Um, we had books from those 10 boxes go to three different schools. We had it go to our um, Negros Mission Academy in Bacolod City. We had them go to our Bacolod um, Adventist Elementary School. And also we had some go to the Pontevedra School. And so this is just some of the, the books and textbooks that they received. They were so excited. I was a little hesitant about if they would use these books. And they said everything that they was there is they can use it. And they already have teachers coming by borrowing books to read because they're interested in reading. But there's a lot of storybooks. Storybooks by um, uh, young blood, you know, like um, Suki Duki and Big Mo, Fire on the Mountain, all these mission storybooks. I don't know if you guys grew up with those. Um, but uh, we had a bunch of those and those have uh, been uh, uh, real popular and real hit with them, and here's, so this is just a few pictures of them receiving these books and magazines. Um, and these are the teachers, they're at uh, the Negros Mission Academy, uh, going through all the books, and they were just, they wanted to thank the Cascade Church for um, uh, sending these things for them, uh, to them, because they will be u- well used. Um, this is one of the teachers at the Bacallan Elementary School, we call it Adventist Elementary School, um, showing the books that they received from it also. Also, the, um, there is a lot of Spirit of Prophecy books that was sent, and um, um, uh, if you remember, Jonathan, no, Jonathan 
the picture of the guy by the motorcycle that was uh, on Evangelum. His wife, which is standing right here, um, right in front there, um, she is uh, she's the one that has been very active in distributing all the stuff and going through all the books and stuff. And it's just really good to have um, her there to uh, do it. And this is just some of the elementary school kids receiving some, uh, some I don't know what those are, I can't remember. Anyway, some books that we sent. Um, so just this last month, just this, oh, a couple weeks ago, three weeks ago, two weeks ago, um, I got a call from um, uh, Brenda Dedeter, at our, uh, the secretary at uh, Three Sisters School. She goes, we have some more textbooks. Do you want them? And I said, well, I just sent 10 off. I go, I don't know. Um, but here, I go, take some pictures of it, send it to me, and I'll send them on to the Philippines to see if they, they want them. They can't wait for these books. They don't have any social study books like this. They don't have anything like this. And, uh, and they are just so excited now that they're going to be receiving some of these. So I have a whole box. I just filled, packed it up last, this week. And a whole box of books like this going, uh, going to the Philippines. So it's, uh, it's exciting to see and it's fun to do. Um, so that's kind of what we're doing. And, and that's kind of the... the um, our thing, this book here, The Ten Commandments Twice Removed, um, the conference has asked they're at, uh, uh, for 2,000 of those. So I'm working right now with um, 3ABN to get 2,000 of these sent over to the Philippines. Um, I think we'll probably have to have them send them to me and then, and then uh, I'll pack them and send them on to the Philippines. So that is the last picture. So if you want to turn the lights back on. Amen. And um, things, are, it, things are happening over there. It's real exciting. It's, oh, the, the thing I didn't show you is that I have lots of pictures. I get lots of pictures from um, uh, this pastor at Elecante Church and another lay pastor over on an island, Cebu, which I've never met before, about his activities over there. And it seems like every other week or so I'm getting multiple pictures of baptisms. And it's just amazing to see and hear about all these people being baptized. The Lord is, the Lord is truly um, working over there, and it's exciting to see it and be, to be part of that. Um, one of God's desires is to see his church be a church that is reaching out to people who have not yet heard the word of God not a church that is self-focused, but one that is reaching out. And I just have to, to mention that, and I'm, Russell, I'm really glad you mentioned the dental clinic um, that's in the bulletin here. Please read this about the dental clinic. This is dental clinics going to be, that we're putting on in October. It's going to be much larger than what we have done in the past three years. Last year was the largest up till this, uh, until this year. Um, we're hope we're going to be in the convention center there at the River House, and um, we're going to have up to 14 stations uh, for the, for doctors to work at. That means that's doctors and hygienists. So that means we need an, an additional 20 or so dental assistants for our other things, which is almost double what we had last year. And so, please pray about this. Keep this in your prayers because uh, that's a lot of people. And but I think we can do it, you know, Lord willing. Um, so Randy Myers with uh, Caring Hand International has asked us to start praying about this, and he wants a three month prayer time for this outreach. And I think that we'll be um, that we'll be blessed with this, and I think we'll serve a lot of people. Um, so when we are talking about missions, I'm going to now switch to my glasses here. What are we talking about? We're talking about people taking the gospel to taking taking the gospel to people that we have not yet heard or have not heard about Jesus, and to those who may have heard about Jesus but don't know him personally. You know, in the Philippines, I think a lot of people know who Jesus is, but they don't know him personally. In Missions, we are also talking about assisting and equipping and helping those who are already spreading the gospel. 
As a church and being part of a church family, each one of us has a responsibility and missions to assist and engage in, in reaching people. All of us have a part to play in missions. So why is missions so important? Well, the number one reason, because that's something that is close to God's heart. God loves people. He has a heart for the lost. He not only loves his followers, but dearly loves those who have, who have not heard of him. Those still in sin. He has a heart for the lost. Think of the effort that we go through just reassuring ourselves of God's love through our own personal Bible studies. And even if we have already known him for, let's say, 5, 10, 15, 40 years, and we still need that assurance that God loves us. And think of those who have not yet experienced that. All of us need reassurance that God loves us, for God is love. 1 Timothy 2, 3, and 4 says, For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved, who will have all men to be saved, and to come into the knowledge of truth. God's heart is to see that all people are saved. This is his plan from the very begin from the very beginning. When God called Abraham in Genesis chapter 12, he didn't just say to Abraham, "Come and I will bless you and make you happy." No, he says, "I will make you a blessing and through you I will bless all the world." That was God's that was God's heart from the beginning. He didn't call Abraham to have an exclusive elite group just for himself, but he called Abraham so that through him he would bless all people of the world. So it is with the church. His church today, he is calling us so that through us we can spread the good news of the gospel to a dying world so that all may be blessed and have that choice to be saved. John 3.16, we all know it. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So this is God's heart, that, one, that no one would be lost, that all might be saved, not just for those sitting in church. So why is missions important? Number two, Jesus is the only remedy. Jesus is the only answer and is the only remedy for a sin-sick world. 1 Timothy 2.5 says, For there is one God, one mediator between God and man, the man Jesus Christ. One God and one mediator. Acts 4.12 says, Neither is there salvation in any other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. There is only one name, that, and it is the name of Jesus, which means if we keep the gospel to ourselves, it's not going to reach people that haven't heard it. So we have the answer, because we have the answer through God's work. Through the power of Jesus, we must make every effort to take Jesus to the world. And also, we are... His believer, because his believers are God's primary agents. That is our responsibility. God doesn't use anybody else to spread the gospel. In Matthew 28, uh, 28, 19 and 20, when Jesus gave the Great Commission, he wasn't talking to the angels, but he was giving it to his followers like you and me. Mark 15, uh, 16, 15 says, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. And in Christ's Object Lessons, uh, Alan White says this, Service to God includes personal ministry. By personal effort, we are to cooperate with, with him, Jesus, for, saving, for the saving of the world. All who are uh, ordained into life of Christ are ordained to the work of, of the salvation of their fellow men. Their hearts will throb in unison with the heart of Christ. The same longing for souls that Christ has. But not all can fill the same place of, 
of this work. But there is a place and a work for all. That comes out of Christ Object Lesson 300 and 301. So we are God's primary agents in spreading the gospel. And I like the story that comes out of Acts um, 5, 19 and 20. Peter and John were put in prison because of preaching the gospel. But while in prison and heavily guarded, the angel of God comes and removes their chains and opens the door, releasing them, and then tells them to go back to the temple and preach the gospel to the people, telling them all about what Jesus has done. Now, God could have told angels to go preach the gospel, and they could have been, been very, very convincing. But no, he tells Peter and John that they must go back and preach it. The angels get in powers, Peter and John, to do so through the Holy Spirit. So God has commissioned not angels, but you and me to bring the gospel to a lost and dying world. And this, and there is, um, and and today the need is is even greater. The need has been never been greater than it is now. We are living in a very crucial time, like never before. The exploding population, political unrest, extreme poverty, natural disasters, and there seems to be more turning away from the from or intolerance of, to Christianity, especially in the more developed nations. So time is short. Matthew 24, 14 says, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world for a witness unto all nations, and then shall the end come. That's a pronounced command. It's an invitation, and it's a promise. This passage is a, is a scripture paired with the Great Commission in Matthew 28, 19, directly challenging the faith and actions of Seventh-day Adventist Christians. As Adventists, we are passively, as Adventists, are we pass, passively waiting for Jesus to come? Or is he waiting for us? There is about 7.7 billion people in the world today. That's as of, as of April 2019. More than 3 billion have never had a chance to hear about Jesus. And 97% of those live in what they call the 1040 window. Given this information, you might think that Christians everywhere would enthusiastically, enthusiastically make the 1040 window their top priority. But this isn't, isn't the case. Evangelistic spending in the 1040 window barely qualifies as a blip. Out of all the church, Christian churches, only one-tenth of one percent of churches have evangelism in their budget. And let's just look. I did this morning, I, I, I looked up on the internet about the 7.7 .7 billion people. And it's really interesting to find out that in AD 1, around the time of Christ, there was approximately 300 million people on earth. About 200 to 250 years later, another 100 million was added. So that's 400 million. Another 200 to 250 years later, another 100 million people were added. That's 500 million. By the early 1800s, that had doubled to 1 billion. And only 127 years later, in 1927, it hit 2 billion. 33 years later, it hit uh, it, 2 billion. It hit 3 billion in 1960. In 1974, 14 years later, it hit 4 billion. 13 years after that, in 1987, it hit 5 billion. And 12 years later, in 1999, 6 billion. And currently in 2019, we have 7.7 .7 billion. On an average, every decade, 
or increasing our population by one billion. Ted Wilson, the president of the General Conference of Seventh-day Adventists, says this, an important key to spreading the gospel in this area, the 1040 window, is to use indigenous workers. They already know the language, the religion, the culture of their people. Overall, approximately 75% of baptism in many areas of the 1040 window are due to dedicated efforts of Bible workers. Once you make a few disciples and within a, particular, within a particular group, they can be trained and empowered and spread, to spread the message like wildfire among others within their people group. And I see that already in the Philippines. For instance, one of the Bible study groups that I attended um, was because of a crusade and newly baptized members spreading the word to their community. And one of the members of that group then went to their area and had already started another Bible study group. And so this is how it spreads. As encouraging as it is to hear reports like this, an enormous task still remains because millions upon millions of people are still waiting to hear of Jesus for the first time. Ted Wilson goes on, and says, we can make a difference in people's lives now and for eternity. Our calling is not to be people of the pew who simply socialize and do church. Instead, Jesus has asked each of us to be part of a God-ordained search and rescue mission. Not just local focus, but also a global focus. With such a huge population and very few followers of Christ, the task of spreading Jesus and the gospel and his love and the plan of salvation can be quite overwhelming. So here's what we can do today to help fulfill the Great Commission. Number one, pray. Be a daily prayer missionary on behalf of the 1040 window. Pray for the people who live there. Pray for the church members, those lives uh, witness to those around them. Pray, to, pray for the church leaders. Pray for the Bible workers and ask the Lord for a harvest for more workers. Number two, tell. Be an ambassador and let others know of the need in the 1040 window. Number three, adopt. You can be a missionary to other countries without leaving your home by adopting a Bible worker or giving your financial support to help support their work. The question we must ask ourselves is whether we truly want Jesus to come. If we do, our hearts will be changed. We will once again love the way he does and love well, and, and this love will compel us to take the gospel to the whole world, to set captives free from the prison of sin. Then Jesus will come. We'll have our closing hymn now.